All right, everyone, let's open in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, Jesus, you have brought us here tonight to learn about you. Thank you, Jesus, for drawing us close to you. We ask that you would send us your Holy Spirit. Fill our minds, fill our hearts, let us hear from you tonight. Give us your words, give us your thoughts, open our hearts, and let us understand how very much you love us and how you are calling us to live. Thank you, Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, what did you think of today's readings? A lot. Yeah. That, it's about the meatiest section of the Bible, am I right? With the possible exception of the crucifixion resurrection. So, I, uh, I backed off from my original estimate. I thought I'd be able to do chapters 3 through 7 this week, or at least I, I hoped I would. I was wrong. I was completely wrong. So, we're going to do chapters 3, 4, and 5 tonight. Oh, okay. We're going to do the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and the first chapter of the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, then, we'll finish up the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 6 and 7, both incredibly meaty verses, uh, both incredibly meaty chapters. And I expect we'll also do chapters 8 and 9, healings of Jesus. So next week, chapters 6 through 9. I don't want to rush through the Sermon on the Mount. There is so much amazing material in here, and we need to figure it out. All right. Last week, we began the Gospel of Matthew. We saw that it is all about Christ our King, how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament covenants, how he is the promised Messiah, and how he declares his everlasting reign over his people, the kingdom of heaven, forever. Jesus' genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, it's not merely a list of names. This list was crafted to show that Jesus is the heir of David, that he sits on the throne of David, that he is the rightful Messiah of Israel. The list also features four Gentile women, the shady ladies, the unlikely heroes of the faith, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. These women show that Jesus' kingdom reaches beyond Israel and brings in the Gentiles, the sinners, the outcasts. Jesus' birth, again, is all about bringing in the Gentiles. The Israelites see the birth of their own Messiah as a threat, a threat to their way of life. The people of Jerusalem are troubled. The chief priests and scribes can't be bothered to care enough to go look for him. I said they'd had one too many uh, Messiah red alerts before. And King Herod wants his infant rival dead. Who is faithful to God? Once again, it's the Gentiles. Wise men from the East offer him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, representing Jesus the King, Jesus who is God, and Jesus who dies for us on the cross. The wise men find Jesus, they encounter God, and they return home with great joy. The other faithful character in Matthew's account of Jesus' nativity is, of course, Joseph. Joseph never says a word in Scripture, but he hears God's voice, listens to him, and does everything he says. He loves and protects Mary and Jesus. He's an amazing example for us. May we, too, listen to God, do whatever he tells us, and be devoted to Mary and Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, we're in week two of the Gospel of Matthew, and we have the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Let's get started. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt wrapped around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Thank you. What is John's message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
What does John mean by repent? Shout it out. Change your ways. Repent. Change your ways. Also, in the light of what's coming up here, the Sermon on the Mount, it especially means change your heart. John the Baptist and Jesus don't just want to see good actions. They want to see hearts filled with love. They want to see the whole package. Uh, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God, the reign of the Messiah. John's listeners understood him to be saying, the Messiah is coming. Get ready now. Now, John was an ascetic, a man of penance. He lived off the land, wore odd clothes, and ate odd food. Why? He was odd. Yes. He's the new Elijah. Elijah also wore the hair shirt with a leather belt, lived off the land. The very last words in the Old Testament foretell a new Elijah. Flip back just a few pages. Or past 1st and 2nd Maccabees, if you've got my Bible. <clears throat> to Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Last two verses in the Old Testament. John the Baptist is the new Elijah, who comes before the great and awesome day of the Lord. He's also, back to Matthew, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, saying, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We hear that every Advent... That's from the the book of Isaiah. That's also talking about John the Baptist. Now, there's there's a lot of digging to do here. I'm going to draw a little map here. This is the spot where John baptized Jesus, right on the Jordan River, right across the Jordan River from Jericho. Three very important things happened in the Old Testament on that very spot in the Jordan River. Raise your hand if you can remember any of them. James, that's where Joshua first led the Israelites into the promised land. They built the the memorial stones in the river. So the idea there is that uh, that's a symbol of baptism in the Old Testament. The people come through water and they're saved. They make it to the promised land. All right, anything else? There's two more. What happened on that spot in the Old Testament? I mean, I suppose you could say Joshua's two spies must have crossed over Jer- yeah, to Jericho from there, but, I, but I'm not thinking of that. That's all pretty much the same episode there. It's no, entering no, the promised no. land. So, no. Here's the other two. We've got Elijah was taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot at this very spot. If you'll remember, Elijah whacked his cloak on the river, parted it, crossed the river, and then the chariot took him up to heaven. Exact same spot. John, then, is standing, wearing Elijah's clothing, preaching and baptizing right where Elijah used to. It doesn't get any more obvious than that. Then, the, number three, there's Elisha. Elisha healed Naaman from leprosy in the Jordan River at this very spot. And that's another type of baptism. Another foreshadowing of baptism. So, consider this. If John the Baptist is the new Elijah... Jesus is the new Elisha. Elisha asked for a double share of the Holy Spirit when Elijah was taken up to heaven, and he got it. He went on to do literally twice the number of miracles that Elijah is recorded to have done, including some miracles that were even greater. He foreshadowed some of Jesus' key miracles. He multiplied food, he raised the dead, and he prefigured baptism with the healing of the Syrian general Naaman. There's another Gentile, right? Naaman was healed in body and soul. Jesus wants to heal us body and soul, too. Now, back to uh, John the Baptist. What is John doing baptizing? What meaning did this have for the Jews? Is this new covenant baptism? No. Jews have always performed ceremonial washings. But in the time of Jesus, there was a group of spiritual reformers called the Essenes. They popularized the idea of baptism as a symbol of repentance. It's not unlike the altar call or the sinner's prayer in an evangelical church. Come forward! The Essenes would baptize people who wanted to repent, 
who wanted to change their lives, and I'd say live for Jesus, but, you know, we're talking about before Jesus here, and live for God. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He's giving an altar call. Did they use the word baptism? Yes, they used the word baptism. The same word that... Same word. But John is very clear in the passage. He says, I baptize with water. This isn't the real thing quite yet. When it's coming after me, he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So we got this, this old covenant baptism, which is a, not a sacrament, but a sacramental, a, a declaration that uh, I'm a sinner and I want to change my life and I'm coming to you, God. John gained quite a reputation as the new Elijah. People came from everywhere to see him. So when the Pharisees and Sadducees showed up seeking baptism, John yelled at them, you brood of vipers. Why? Hypocrites. John knew they weren't sincere. He knew they were just coming to get baptized because it was what all the cool kids were doing. So people could see how holy they were. That's what all the cool kids were doing. The word hypocrite in Greek means actor. John is saying to them, you just want to act like you're holy. You don't think you're sinners. You don't think you need to change your lives. You're not going to change your lives. Get out of here. John and Jesus, as we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount, cannot bear superficial outward piety. They are all about conversion of heart. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Don't just look holy in front of other people. Actually turn away from sin and actually draw close to God. John warns the Pharisees and the Sadducees, don't kid yourselves that you're special because you're children of Abraham. God is able to turn stones into children of Abraham. Even now, the ax is at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bear good fruit will be thrown into the fire. Repent and bear good fruit. Any thoughts on John the Baptist? Yeah. Well, don't mess with him. Yeah, I agree. He sounds scary. You know, that's a good question, and we've got at least a partial answer. We know that John's father, Zechariah, was a priest in the temple. Yes. He came from a well-to-do family. Exactly. He came from a well-to-do priestly family. Yes. So why is John not in the temple? He should be in the temple. And, uh, you know, I'm actually, that, that could be an example too, but I'm thinking of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah also came from a priestly family. And as soon as he got up to perform his priestly duties, he began to prophesy, you hypocrites. You're making sacrifices and you're not changing your lives. He didn't last very long in the temple. And I'm thinking John had much the same career track. And we don't know that. We don't know if he ever went to the, we don't know if he ever had a career in the temple at all, or we don't know if he got disillusioned before he even started and went straight out into the desert. But John in the desert really is offering a kind of alternate temple. He's saying by his actions, the temple in Jerusalem is too corrupt. If you really want to find God, come here. Listen to me. The Messiah is coming. Get rid of your sins. <laughs> and, you know, it's true on the I mean, John's got no position. And that was true for most of the prophets. Yeah. The only credibility they've got is that they're preaching the word of God and people recognize it and either hate him or love him. Absolutely. And including even the Pharisees and Sadducees. I've got to think he spoke to them that way because he knew that if he kissed up to them and gave them, them extra courtesy, that wouldn't be changing anything. He, he wanted to give them a wake-up call. All right. The baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus comes to be baptized. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is filling for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and behold, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Jesus is sinless. 
He didn't need to repent. He didn't need to come to John and have a baptism of repentance. So why did Jesus want to be baptized? The, the answer is to fulfill all righteousness. That's pretty obscure, huh? So what does that mean? Well, we've talked about how Jesus... No, I'm not going off on that track. <laughs> uh-uh. Okay. Why did Jesus want to be baptized? To identify with us sinners. He's the opposite of the Pharisees. He is willing to be counted among us sinners, although he is sinless. He takes our sins on himself because he loves us. Jesus' baptism points forward to his crucifixion and resurrection, dying and rising to new life. Jesus performs Old Testament rituals to fulfill them and perfect them in the New Covenant. At the Last Supper, Jesus is going to change the Passover meal into the Eucharist. Here, he's taking John's baptism of water and announcing a new baptism of the Holy Spirit, which doesn't actually come about until after his crucifixion and resurrection. And finally, Jesus' baptism marks the start of his ministry as it marks the start of ours. In the Old Testament, high priests were washed and anointed for ministry, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Kings of Israel, David in particular, were anointed for ministry, and the Holy Spirit rushed in upon them. That was their commissioning ceremony. This is Jesus's. He is baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes down on him and commissions him for ministry. What does this passage tell us about our baptism? A lot. Jesus's baptism is our baptism. We are commissioned for ministry to go preach the gospel. The Holy Spirit rushes in on us. Jesus heard a verse from the Father saying, you are my beloved son. We are adopted as children of God. Also, Jesus didn't have any sins to wash away, but our sins are washed away. Finally, there's an appearance of the Trinity. Jesus stands in the Jordan and the people see the Holy Spirit descend on him in the form of a dove. They hear the voice of the Father. They see the Son. We, too, are baptized into the Holy Trinity. Also, the Spirit descending over the waters brings to mind the creation of the world at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Remember how the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters just before God said, let there be light? We have got a picture of new creation here because in baptism, the Holy Spirit makes us a new creation. It's like he hovers over us and says, let there be light. And he is the light. And in just a minute, he's going to say, you are the light of the world, and it's because you've been baptized into Christ. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on Jesus' baptism or our baptism? All right. Next we have the temptation of Jesus. Right after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I think that we, we get alarm bells in our head right there. Wait, Jesus was led by the Spirit into temptation? Why did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into temptation? Because in this life, God allows us and even wills us to undergo temptation. Why? Because it is through trials that we grow in virtue. It is through resisting temptation that we become closer to God. To become physically stronger, so people lift weights. And once the weights get too easy, what do you do? You add resistance. It's the same thing in the spiritual life. Of course, God gives us peaceful times and wonderful gifts because we're his children, and he loves to give us good gifts. But at the same time, because we're his children, he doesn't want to do everything for us. He also gives us spiritual battles to fight because he wants us to become spiritually strong, because he wants us to learn to become grown-ups in the faith. He wants us to get really good at resisting evil and choosing good. So, God allows Jesus to be tempted, to identify with us, to triumph over sin for us, and to show us how to fight back. What are Jesus' three temptations? Turn stones into bread so he can eat. Jump off the temple and be rescued by angels so the people will adore him. 
and to worship Satan. And Satan says he give them the, he'll give them the kingdoms of the world. These correspond to three of the four classic temptations. Pleasure, wealth, honor, and power. One missing from the temptation of Jesus is wealth, by the way, but we'll get there. Pleasure, wealth, honor, and power in their proper places are good gifts of God. But we humans are so awful at letting them stay in their proper place. We crave them, fade over them, center our lives around them, and agonize over not getting them. They are the classic substitutes for God. Turn stones into bread. Which one of those is that? Pleasure. pleasure. It's the temptation of pleasure or comfort or the flesh. Make, th make life easy. Satan tempts Jesus. You don't have to put up with the agony of extreme hunger. Just eat already. But those weren't God's instructions. God's instructions are more important than food. Jump off the temple and be rescued by angels so people will adore you. Which, which temptation is that? Honor. Honor. Satan tempts Jesus. You don't have to put up with being mocked and looked down on by people who think they're the spiritual elite. Show them you're the son of God. But those weren't God's instructions. God's instructions are more important than honor. And the last one, bow down to me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world. Which one is that? Power. And yeah, you could say wealth and power. Satan tempts Jesus. You don't have to put up with being persecuted. You're the king of kings. Show them who's boss. But those weren't God's instructions. God's instructions are more important than power. How about us? Can we see where in our lives we get hung up on pleasures, comforts, the desires of the flesh, distractions, instead of being spiritual athletes and training for God? Do we agonize over money or possessions, having enough, not having enough? Do our many possessions get in the way of loving people and loving God? Do we agonize over being admired or not admired? Do we care too much about looking good instead of being good? And do we agonize over not having the power to do the things we want to do? Do we use the power we have to build ourselves up, lord it over others, casually hurt them? Thank you for the honest people who nodded yes to all four. I am one of them. I would like us to pray right now over which of these four God wants us to repent from so he can free us. Pick one, even if, even if you nodded to all four. Where does God want to free you? Where does God want to fight the spiritual battle right now? Let's take a minute and pray. Ten seconds. All right. If you picked an area of your life where, where you believe God wants to free you, I would encourage you to think strategy. Consider an act of penance to show you're serious about fighting Satan. What did Jesus do in the wilderness? He fasted and prayed. What can we do? If pleasure is our temptation, that's when perhaps we pray instead of eating or watching TV or what have you. If it's wealth, perhaps pray and give something away. If it's honor, perhaps 
pray and risk looking ridiculous to do something for God. If it's power, perhaps pray and choose to do some humble work for God. You can tailor it to yourself. You know better what you need to do to, uh, to have a particular temptation lose its grip on you. Besides fasting and praying, how else did Jesus fight Satan with scripture? Every time Satan tested him, Jesus fought back with scripture. When we are tempted, we can fight back the same way. Know your weaknesses and have some Bible verses in your pocket to combat them. Memorize those scriptures or at least know where to find them when you need them. Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the armor of God, is a great spiritual warfare text. I also love St. Patrick's breastplate. Choose texts that apply to you, remember them, use them. I've got an everyday example. This past week, I've been getting an unusual amount of spiritual warfare around these classes. And when that was happening, I pulled out Psalm 40. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your compassion from me. And at Mass yesterday, I felt like I got an answer. Psalm 121 in the readings. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will guard you from all evil. The Lord will guard your coming and your going both now and forever. All right. Thank you. You've got this. Wonderful. So, do battle with scriptures in hand. Find texts that, that speak to you and listen for God's reply. Any thoughts so far? It's true. And it can be very useful to pick a scripture promise that, that reminds you of what you need to know. You know, the, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? All right, there's one other place where Satan tested Jesus, and it's in a place he really likes to test us as well. Satan tested Jesus' very identity as the Son of God. He said, if you really are the Son of God, then throw yourself off the temple. He tried to tempt Jesus to be the Messiah people wanted, to be that earthly political ruler who'd come and, oh, and to avoid suffering and death. Satan tries to test our identity as children of God all the time. If God is really there, why is this happening? If God really cared, why wouldn't he do something about this? If God really loves me, why don't I see him? One of the very best ways we can resist the devil in anything is to get it through our heads that we are God's dearly beloved chosen ones. He loves you like he loves Francis of Assisi. He loves us more than we can imagine, and nothing is ever going to change that. Now, intellectually, we all know this, but that's one of those beliefs that doesn't always travel from head to heart. We desperately need to help it to travel from head to heart all the time. That's one major reason for daily prayer. For me, that's involved meditating on Song of Songs and listening to Christian music with God loves you this much lyrics. Because during those times when we're not 100% saturated with the idea that God loves us and knows what he's doing, that's when we get frustrated and discouraged and lose our way. When we are 100% saturated with the idea that God loves us and knows what he's doing and he's in control and he's got this, it makes a world of difference in how we live. We trust God, we find joy, we love him, and we're able to share that love with others. When we pray daily, we are able to stand strong in that knowledge that God loves us so very much. Does that make sense? Is that your experience as well? You know, I, I expect Satan had creative distractions back then too, but I, I completely agree with you that noise and distraction are two of Satan's greatest weapons, and they're more rampant now than they've ever been in all of human history. They didn't have iPhones. Exactly. I mean, you're absolutely right. 
It must have been easier to be a good Jew. It is so easy to distract ourselves from important things. We can keep ourselves entertained and distracted all the time if we wish. And it, it can be so hard to break out of that. But to go back to what you were saying about how it feels like there's this one hour in mass where, you know, where you're not being distracted, where you don't have a million things pulling out. You're, all you have to do is sit there or kneel or stand and worship and be with God. How can you bring that into the rest of the week? You, I mean, you mentioned this class, and if this serves that purpose for you, that's wonderful. How, how else can we bring it into the rest of the week? Yeah, I'd say we need to make a real effort to, to push back the noise and push back the distraction to, to schedule prayer times, and even just to schedule, you know, Sabbath time. Not necessarily, I mean, if it can be a Sunday with no work, great. But if we can push back the noise and distraction on Sunday or one day a week and make that, that quiet space for, for more God time than wonderful. St. Francis de Sales, the, uh, the bishop, not the parish, recommended that uh, try and take one thing out of your morning prayer time, one conclusion, one aha moment, and bring it into the rest of your day. Try to remember it at certain moments throughout the day so that you, you actually bring it into your life and bring it into your day and start to live it. That's his suggestion. He called it the little bouquet of flowers you carry with you and smell all day long. <laughs> all right. This is great stuff, you guys. Okay. One more point on the temptation of Jesus. I mentioned it last week, but I'll mention it again. Jesus is recapitulating the history of Israel when he's being tempted by the devil. He's reliving it and making it right. During those, his 40 days in the wilderness, he's recapitulating Israel's 40 years in the wilderness during the Exodus. He relives the same temptations. The Israelites whined for lack of bread, and Jesus was tempted to turn stones into bread. The Israelites tested God. God, if you don't give us water right now, we're going back to Egypt. And Jesus was tempted to test God by throwing himself off the temple to see if the angels would catch him. The Israelites were tempted to worship the golden calf, think that God had given up on them, and Jesus was tempted to worship Satan. I don't know how tempted he really was, but that was the temptation anyway. The Israelites failed all these tests. Jesus passed them. Because he passed the test, he's able to help us pass the test as well. The book of Hebrews says, because Jesus himself has suffered and was tempted, he is able to help us who are tempted as well. So, when we're tempted, we turn to Jesus. Now we have the beginning of Jesus' ministry. When John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus took that as the sign to begin his mission. He continued preaching John's exact message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But instead of preaching in the wilderness, he went to Galilee. There's the Sea of Galilee right here. There's... Capernaum. Jesus bases his ministry in the village of Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Why? Well, a couple easy answers. Jesus is from Galilee, although Nazareth is not very close to Capernaum. Yes, Jesus' disciples are from Galilee, and at least four of them are from Capernaum. But there's more. According to Matthew's Gospel, this was to fulfill the prophecy from Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Capernaum is right on the border between Zebulun and Naphtali, so it fulfills that prophecy from Isaiah. Another reason for Galilee is that's the place where the 12 tribes of Israel were first scattered during the Assyrian invasion during the 8th century BC. So Galilee is the place where Jesus is going to begin reversing that tragedy of Israel's history, the scattering of the tribes. Again, Jesus is recapitulating Israel's history, and he's undoing all the bad things. There in Capernaum, Jesus calls his first disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, all fishermen. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. God takes our natural talents and our abilities that we've worked on and uses them for the kingdom of heaven. God takes these fishermen, 
men who aren't afraid of hard work, who patiently go out all night trying to catch fish, and he makes them missionaries for the kingdom of heaven. What is your talent? What is your passion? How is God using that? Or how has God used that for his kingdom? Can you think of a connection? It's worth trying to think of a connection. I'm talking about us. What's our connection? What's our talent? What's our passion? How has God used it? How is God using it now? Not just for us to get ahead in life or for us to enjoy ourselves, but for the kingdom of heaven. I, I remember always wondering why, how, how loving history was going to possibly help me in life growing up. And God used it. When Jesus called his first disciples, they followed him immediately. May we too follow God immediately. One of my husband's favorite lines is, delayed obedience is disobedience. Right, it's much better to change course and do it. But uh, that's, I, I guess I'm not thinking of that, where you, uh, where you say no but mean yes. I'm thinking of where you know what God wants you to do, and you put off doing it. We actually see that, I, I, I'm trying to remember if it's Matthew or another gospel, where Jesus calls disciples and they say, first let me bury my father, first let me do this, and Jesus says, no. So there, there's an example of how delayed obedience would be disobedience. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so often Jesus gives us a chance to turn around and make it right on a certain point, but sometimes the ship sails, and then we just have to go and do the next thing right. But really, the point is, begin obeying now. Even if you've disobeyed in the past, begin obeying now. I need to remember that line, delayed obedience is disobedience, when I'm toying with not doing something God wants me to do. That's the time to remember that line.